I want you, if you enjoy the study, and not that it's about enjoying it, but about learning something, if you learn something from it, rather, uh, get the rest of those slides from Ray, and um, maybe you can get some things and take uh, for your spiritual walk in that as well. When I saw the list of topics, I was pretty excited because the very first topic is what is true. So I want to look about the truth about truth. And it's something that is neglected in the spiritual world today. Uh, so as I look at these topics, I can't help but think about this question, Noah, who built the ark? <laughs> Noah, who built the ark? Noah did. Noah did. Noah, what if I told you you were wrong? You'd say, well, go to your Bible, right? And it amazes me that when we think about the Old Testament especially, it's pretty black and white. We say, yep, Noah built the ark. Abraham was pro God promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 these blessings. But when it gets to the New Testament, suddenly it says something. We say, well, God didn't mean that. Surely it couldn't really mean that. For example, baptism, Romans 6, Acts 2, all these different places. But God didn't mean that. Instrumental music, Colossians chapter 3. God didn't really, God didn't really mean that we're supposed to sing with our hearts, sing with understanding, did he? So I don't understand, as we look at this, I, I don't really understand how we use this interpretive device for the Old Testament, what it says is what it means, but we get to the New Testament, and suddenly what it says is not so straightforward. Or that's the way we like to interpret it, at least. And as I think about these series of studies, one's devotion and belief in the Bible as truth is directly related to one's response and devotion to doctrine. I'll say it again. One's belief in the Bible as truth is directly related to my devotion to doctrine. If I don't think the Bible is truth, if I don't really think that the Bible, what it says is what it means, then who cares what I believe in? Who cares about doctrine? Who cares about teaching? If I believe what I, what I think is, is better, or I can view what I want in the Bible and I want to be there, if that's better than what it actually says, then, well... Baptism is no longer needed. Instrumental music is okay. Mercy, well, what is that, right? Grace, yeah, that's okay too, I guess. All these topics suddenly are basically useless. So as we look at this, I want to ask you basically, are you going to choose what you want it to say or what God intended it to say? That's really the decision before us. As we think about truth, are you going to choose what you want it to say are you going to allow God to speak through His Word to us? A few years back, I went to a camp called Quest Camp. And the theme of it was myth versus reality. And in this, we did some experience, uh, experiments talking about, you know, how you put the little uh, Pepto things in the Coke bottle and it explodes up. And, and, you know, they give us like five or ten different things. You can experiment to see what would make the biggest explosion and things of that nature. But as we look at this study, there's really four major questions we need to ask. Is one just as good as the other? Is myth or reality? Which one's better? Is it ignorant to believe in absolute truth? Because more and more people, especially in the professional world, are saying that it's ignorant to believe that God's word is absolute truth. Can it really be proven? Isn't that key? Is there really a way that I can know what God wants me to think about baptism or, or music or mercy or grace or his love or judgment? Is there really a way that I can determine exactly what God wants? Most people are saying no. Most people, even in the church, are saying, well, you take a look around. Think about how many religious groups there are. Think about how many churches you have to pass or church buildings that you pass as you drive just here. Who's right and who's wrong? Or is everybody wrong? It's called postmodernism, and we'll get to that later. But there is a way to know what God wants us to know. And it's through His Word. And we don't need to lose hope in that. We don't need to lose hope in that we can actually understand what God wanted us to understand. Finally, how can we even know that there is such thing as truth? Is there a way? People say, well, well Mason, I, I grew up and, and, and they just told me that the Bible was truth. But how can we know that? Does it take faith? Is it just a leap of faith that, well, I think the Bible's true, so therefore, that's what I was taught when I was younger, and I'm just going to believe it. Is there really a way to know that the Bible is truth? And not only that, but we know that it can only be true if it's from God, right, as far as an ultimate standard. You know why? Because if we wrote a book, you can read any book almost, it contradicts itself, doesn't it? 
a guy by the name Bart Ehrman, we'll get to later. It'll say one thing here, and about 20 pages later, it says something else. And he says, oh, I'm right. Well, you contradict your own self. How can you be right? So the question is, really, myth versus reality. And something else, as I was thinking about this topic, I had to introduce it. Does America really hate the truth? In the end, does America really hate the truth? What you think about it? I took a survey at Cane Creek of about 60 people. This is what they say. All 60 that are, you know, maybe 50, I don't know, there's kids of all. Everybody that can answer said America hates truth. Really? You think so? You think America really hates truth? Let me share something with you. Ever seen this? Sworn testimony. I swear by Almighty God that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The affirmation. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. America really, they don't hate truth. They can say they hate truth, but in the end, they want you to be truthful in a court of law, don't they? And if you tell a lie, you know what? I was reading on the internet just a minute ago. If you tell a lie in an execution uh, case, they can actually execute you. Did you know that? That's what some sources say. I don't know law. I'm not a lawyer. But the point is this. We can act like people hate truth, and maybe they do. But there's still some kind of respect in knowing what's right and what's wrong and telling the truth. <coughs> Three questions. Why does it matter if America believes in truth or not? Ever thought about that? Anybody got any reasons? Why does it matter if America believes in truth or not? Let me tell you this. Turn on the news. If America believes in truth, you don't have murderers. You don't have rapists. You don't have any of this stuff. You say, well, what about that passage in 1 Corinthians 6? It says uh, people in there, if they practice all those things and they'll even watch. Well, those people also didn't believe in truth at one time because they were Christians. As we look at, at the world around us, America, and, and I don't want to talk bad about the country, I love the country, but it, the problem is we don't believe in truth. What I want to do is what I can do, and, and if you don't like, well, who cares? Do you think we got that way in the church? Sadly, we have. Maybe not here, but there's tons of places that have. <laughs> Second question for us. Why does it matter if the religious world believes in absolute truth or not? Well, the religious world doesn't believe in absolute truth. That's something when you have so many people doing so many different things thinking they're pleasing to God. And finally, why does it matter if the church believes in absolute truth or not? And that's self-explanatory. At the end of the day, what I believe ain't worth the killing. What I believe really doesn't matter. And what you believe really doesn't matter. But what Scripture says suddenly makes a big difference, doesn't it? And we can sit around and we can argue about things. So that, that's a gray area, Mason. That's just a gray area you can't know. Okay. Maybe there are some gray areas. But you look at the percentage of what we would classify as gray area. It's pretty slim. It's a terrible attitude that we have to say, yeah, Scripture, it's a gray area. We can just do what we want to. God didn't intend it to be that way. <laughs> a few perspectives on truth from King Greek that I want to share, share them with you and some of these are from teenagers, and some of them aren't. Some of these are from three. I think Noah might even have one of these in here. A statement or situation that accurately describes reality, catch this, with no exceptions. That's key, isn't it? Absolute truth is in a fixed state that cannot change and will not change under any circumstance. Something that can't be disputed. Tyler, a teenager at King Creek, this is what he says. I sent him a text. Define absolute truth. To me, and I love that because suddenly it's subjective, absolute truth isn't meant to be subjective. To me, absolute truth has to be completely objective. It cannot be subjective. Is that absolutely true if it's to me, as you said? No. An example would be 1 plus 1 equals 2. There's no other explanation. Well, what if your teacher's wrong? <coughs> Another statement. Absolute truth means knowing that if I follow God's word, I can look forward to heaven. I do believe in it. This is from an older lady at, at the congregation. I do believe in it, but you have to be careful with it. Really, what do you have to be careful about? I think people.
people can use the Bible to justify a number of things that they shouldn't, however, they shouldn't do. However, I do believe there is some gray, and we have situations in life where grace is born. I love this lady to death. I think she's wrong, though. I think that the premise behind this is part of the issues that we have in the church. I ask you, what is absolutely true? Can you say that kind of stuff? Well, there's some gray, and, and grace is good. Well, Paul says something about that. Are we supposed to bank on grace and keep on sinning? God forbid. Now, grace is good. Don't get me wrong. Grace is necessary, and we need grace, and we need to thank God for grace. But to say that we can do anything we want to do religiously and say, well, God's grace is good, that's an issue, a big issue. Truth all the way. That's going to be what one of the elders said. I do, but truth can be a lie that is believed by others. Well, it's not truth then, is it? The truth always prevails. God's word or my heart tells me on how to react. Let me just say this. Be careful on what your heart says. Be careful on what your heart says. Let me tell you why. Because your heart might say something today, and a week later it might tell you something else. Be careful on what your heart says. <coughs> And instead, be more diligent in your study of God's Word. So as we continue tonight, I really want to focus on the idea of the common church of Christ view and how we can know that the Bible is the absolute standard of God. There's really three passages that we love to quote. And the church of Christ is known for quoting scriptures for everything, but sometimes I don't think we quite understand the impact that these verses make as we interpret God's Word. John 8, 32. And notice these are all from John. Kind of interesting. John 8, 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you forget it right there. That's powerful. It says you can know the truth. <coughs> John 18, 38, in the midst of a terrible trial, Jesus is about to be put to death. He's been trialed unfairly and wrongly. <coughs> Pilate said to him, what is truth? When he said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no truth. And finally, the high priestly prayer in John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. God's word is true. So maybe you're saying, Mason, it sounds good, but I'm bored already. I'm bored. I don't really care about absolute truth. Why does it really matter if God's people believe in absolute truth or not? There's five or six reasons that you see on the screen. Number one, the traditional church of Christ is wrong. You say, why does that matter? Well, this is why it matters. You know all those people that you love that are members of the church? <clears> the <throat> word members of the church? If they're wrong, that's the issue, isn't it? Not only that, but some 2,000 years of people have been wrong. That should bring up a question. I'm not saying that we should believe and go along with tradition just because other people did it. But before we go and say, well, they did that for 2,000 years, I guess we should just change things now. You might want to think again. There's a reason that they did it that way for 2,000 years. And maybe we should not be so arrogant in our thinking, thinking that we know more than what everybody else knew in the past. Yeah, we're more developed. We have laptops you can carry around. We have iPads. That doesn't mean we're more intelligent, though, does it? And it especially doesn't mean that we're more wise. Our idea of God and who He is is tainted. If I can't prove that God's Word is absolute truth, I don't want to be a Christian. I don't want a part of it. You know why? Because in this entire book, every single word, if it's not truth, then how do I know what is truth? Some people say, well, you know, the mo most of it is truth. Well, how do you know what's truth and what's not then? It's subjective. You can't. I can say, well, you know, John 1 through 10 is true, but the rest of it's not. You can say, well, John 1 through 10 is not true, the rest of it is, though. Well, who's right? There ain't no way to tell so therefore, if there is one word misplaced in God's scripture, I don't want part of it. It's called inerrancy. The inerrancy of scripture. Big word, simple meaning. Number three. We don't have an absolute standard, thus we must adopt a creed book. You know why creed books exist? They didn't listen to this. You can say, well, we go, to our, we go to the Bible, and if we don't understand, then we go to our creed book. Well, if you go to the Bible, it says you don't need a creed book. 
We can't know when the Bible's right or wrong, so everything or anything goes. And finally, this one's key. Our position on every issue is useless. If there's no such thing as absolute truth, our position on anything is useless. I love this, this slide right here with the bullseye on it. Because if you don't get absolute truth right, you can't get any of the other right. If you don't get this one lesson right, none of the other, it, it doesn't matter. It's useless. And this is why this is so vital. And it's something that we don't talk about. You know how many times I preach absolute truth? It came correct in two years? Once. Because I was preparing, preparing for this lesson, so I said, I'll preach it there too. But really, in essence, the last, if, if they don't believe in absolute truth, the last two years was useless and, and a waste of time. So maybe we should start with absolute truth and work our way out. <coughs> so there's two things on the line. Our faith is useless and void if absolute truth is simply a myth. Or our faith is vital and invaluable if absolute truth is reality. And how do we know evidence? And really, it ends up to this next slide. You have two paths. You have one that's a path of the Bible, and the other one is what you think it did. Now when I say that, I want to be careful. God intended for us to use emotions as we worship. He requires that. But we must be very careful when we say, I think and feel this is what God is saying. That doesn't mean we go to the text abrasive and crude and rough and say, well, you need to believe this or you're going to hell. There's really not a place for that. Now, let me say that too. There, there, there are people that are going to be bound for hell. But it doesn't do a lot of good to be that harsh and brutal, generally speaking. But we must be very careful when we begin to say, well, this is what God's Word is saying to me. Because that automatically says, well, it can mean something different to you. And that's the issue. How can another Bible be true, and why does it matter if the Bible is an absolute standard? Interestingly, dictionary.com describes it as this conformity with fact or reality. Catch this a verified or indisputable fact, proposition, or principle, or the like. Webster says the real facts about something in accordance with fact. We'll skip that slide due to time. Objectivity versus subjectivity. You say, oh man, you're getting deep. What is that? Objectivity. He's going to want to slide behind you. Not influenced, catch that, not influenced by personal feelings or opinions. Now, that's impossible for us. It's impossible for me to go to God's Word and not to have any kind of personal experience, personal bias come into my, my interpretation of it. You know why? Because I've lived 20 years. And the way I see life has been molded by the events and things that's happened in my life. So what do we do about it? You try to be the most objective that you can, and you study in groups. It keeps balance. There's a reason God wanted us to come together for worship. Not only do we encourage each other, but we keep balance. Because suddenly, the way I look at something, you can help balance that out by sharing your opinion, or sharing how you see it. And then eventually, we can come to what the text actually says. Maybe you have here 80, I don't know, 80, 85 people, I don't know. And I might look at Matthew 6, for example, and I might have some kind of crazy view. I try not to, but we all have some things that probably aren't biblical that we believe. And when I mention those things, and people say, well, that's ridiculous. And let me tell you why. They can name some reasons of why that's ridiculous. Suddenly, I change my belief, don't I? But if I never have the opportunity to study in group, I go around and believe a lot. I go around teaching a lot. James chapter 3 says something about that. They'll incur a stricter judgment. You better be careful. Very careful. And that's not just talking about the people in the pulpit. That's talking about us as we go out and evangelize too. I believe that. Subjectivity. Philosophy related to the way a person experiences things in his, his or her own mind based, catch this, based on feelings or opinions rather than fact. In the end, truth flees from subjectivity. You can't have both. You can't always have what you think and feel because what you think and feel ain't always going to be the truth.
Jack Cottrell's book, The Faith Once for All. It's a book I've been reading for Kirk Brothers' class, The Systematic Christian Doctrine. It's a book I recommend to you. Not everything in there is perfect, but it's pretty good. And people automatically say, well, Mason, I'm thankful that you spent a lot of time preparing on absolute truth. But this isn't, a, this isn't a study that just the common old folk need. This is a study for the scholars, the people that sit around round tables and have PhDs on time. This is a study that every Christian from a young age needs to have and needs to understand. Do you think we're teaching our kids this? You don't have to use the word subject and objective. But can't you say what you feel doesn't trump what God's word says? They can understand that from a very young age. A quote from Cottrell. Of course, when the possibility of truth in general is denied, this will also include the denial of the possibility of theological truth. Catch this. And the espousal or, espousal or literary divorcement of doctrinal relativism. Does that make sense to you? Of course, when the possibility of truth in general is denied, when you deny truth, this also includes the denial of of any theological truth and the divorcement of doctrinal relativism. People say, Mason, there's absolutely no such thing as absolute truth. Well, that's an absolute statement. Did you get that? There's absolutely no such thing as truth. That's an absolute statement. You're saying you believe in absolute when you say that. John 18, verse 38. I want to turn in there. We don't have a lot of time, but I do think this is vital. As we look at what is true. John 18, beginning in verse 37. I want you to remember, these people are supposed to be leading in a religious manner. They're supposed to be people that are on God's side. And people that are standing up for what He believes in. John 18, verse 37. Therefore, Pilate said to him, So you're a king? Jesus answered, You say correctly that I'm a king. For this I've been born, for this I've come into the world, guess this, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, guess this, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I release somebody for you at the Passover, you wish that I would release for the killing of the Jews, or king of the Jews rather. So they cried out, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. It seems to me that Pilate has some kind of idea of what Jesus is saying. But you know what affected his decision? What other people thought. What other people thought. Brother, we're the minority. We're the minority. Look at the stats on the internet. The amount of people in the Lord's church compared to the world population is sad. Sad. It shows how straight and narrow that way really is. But that shouldn't make us afraid. That shouldn't make us feel that we're wrong. We can't let the majority of religious people say, well, you know, if y'all were right, you would have more people. God would provide you and you the, the building would be full tonight. Well, not necessarily. We can't let what other people say impact whether we believe what God says is true or not. And that's exactly what happened to Pilate. Mason, I don't know that I believe in truth. True Blood says this, and Cotter quotes this in his book, and I don't want to get luxury or didactic, but this is just the nature of it. We can't be wrong unless there's something to be wrong about. Unless there's truth, there can be no such thing as errors or mistakes. That's pretty self-explanatory. Cotter says this, it is a serious error, though, to equate probability with uncertainty and to think that probability is somehow equivalent to relativism. But the, catch this, but the lack of 100% certainty often is usually just as technicality and is not a legitimate barrier to belief and action. You say, well, Mason, what in the world does that mean? Let me tell you what it means. You say, well, there's no way I can be 100% sure I believe in God and this is His Word. You know why you're saying that to begin with? Because you don't want to do what He says. You're just making an excuse. Because guess what? 
As I read scripture, I look around. Maybe I can't be 100% sure, but I guess what? I could be 99.999 as far as I want to go. And that should not be a barrier to my belief and action and obeying what He says. It's not an excuse. Or not a good one at least if there's such thing as that. The Bible teaches me that truth can be obtained. John 8.32 You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We looked at it a minute ago. Turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I love this book as Paul is writing to a young evangelist. And I'm a young evangelist, and I would love, I've had people in their lives spend time with me and say, Mason, this is what the Bible says, and this is why I can believe it. And I appreciate that so much. I'm thankful that men have invested their time and energy in teaching me. And as I look at Paul and Timothy's relationship, Great things came from Timothy because of Paul. 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. Who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator also between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the public time. I find it interesting that oftentimes when the Bible refers to truth, Jesus is awful close in the context. We've missed John 14, 6. What does it say? I am the way, the truth. We've missed it. People think that you can get to God without Jesus now. Even in the church. You'd be surprised. 3 John chapter 4, as he's right to Gaius, I love this because he talks about truth. <clears throat> and he says that they're walking in truth. Notice that it's something that can be accomplished. It's not something that's just an abstract idea and, that we can't do. Walking in truth is a possibility for every Christian that wants to walk in truth. Acts chapter 8 verse 30. One of my favorite passages. Do you understand what you're reading? It implies that there's a right way and a wrong way. It implies that there's a right way to understand what you're reading in a wrong way. And he joins him and he explains the way. And says this is what it really means. Truth is verifiable and testifiable. Moving on. I know the Bible claims that it's true, but Mason, don't you know men came over the Bible? It's been a long process. Go to the next slide, please. That's the process, basically. You see that? That's the process <coughs> of how the Bible got to us. It's a long one, admittedly. But it's one that you can trace back for the most part and one that we can be confident in. Start with God. The Holy Spirit, New Testament writers, Greek text, church fathers, <laughs> recognition of the canon, saying, and when I say recognition of the canon, you say, oh man, this is like a college class. People didn't sit around and say, well, this is God's Word. They recognized it as God's Word. They didn't decide. They said, yes, this has to be from God because it fits. Look at it. It doesn't have any flaws. They recognized. They didn't decide. It's a huge difference. Because you know why? Those men are just like us. What good are we to sit around and say, well, this, I want to decide this is God's book. And people for thousands of years are going to believe it because of it. We don't have the authority to do that. But surely some men can sit around the table and say, this has to be from God. Look at it. Read it. It's like nothing we've seen before. Committee of translators. There's people behind your Bible. There's people that sit around a table, like Bill Burleson, that know all that stuff and can translate. English translation and finally us. People like Bart Ehrman, they say the Bible has hundreds of thousands of mistakes. Does that not make you uncomfortable, kind of? When you hear that the Bible has hundreds of thousands of mistakes, don't you like, kind of makes you nervous? It doesn't mean. What do we do about it? We have to admit, you compare the King James and the NIV and the ESV and the New American, they don't say all, say all the same thing, do they? They don't all say the, the exact same wording. So does that mean that we can't believe what God said is true? That's called, you read the preface. We don't do that anymore. You read the preface. 
And it tells you how they went about translating and why they made the decisions that they did. It's kind of neat. That doesn't mean that God's Word isn't inspired in the air anymore, does it? I love this picture on the slide. It shows a little young boy and another man. And he's standing on his shoulders trying to take a picture of something. And that's the way we are. We stand on the shoulders of so many. And instead of complaining and griping and being mad about that, we need to be appreciative for that. We don't have much time, but as we're going we're to prove in a second that we can trust that the Bible really is from God. Because if we can't do that, then we can't really think that the Bible is true. Bart Ehrman, a scholar, that's what he claims to be at least, a scholar out of the University of North Carolina says this, Traditionally, the task of the New Testament textual criticism was conceived as one of recovery. All right, what does that mean, Mason? That means that they thought of, uh, at one point in time that you could actually get back to what God wanted it to say. You could get back to what God inspired. It's called the autograph. Notice what he goes on to say. This is understandable for all of us. Don't, don't lose me here. But some leading scholars are arguing that the task should be reconceived as discovery of the earliest available text rather than recovery of the original text. The text is irretrievable. You know what that says? It's impossible to know what God really wanted us to know. That's exactly what he's saying. Do you think that's crept in the religious world? I hope you say yes, because it has. People are saying, well, there's really no way to know what God wants me to know. So what's the alternative? You decide what it says. Ehrman believes that there are more errors in the New Testament than there are words in the New Testament. Isn't that scary? And don't you want to know, is that true? Is it true that there are more errors in the New Testament than there are words? Moving on. And I know this is deep, but I want you to stick with it because it's something that will strengthen your faith. Most scholars agree that there are only about four or five places in the New Testament that are actually questionable. You should find comfort in that. Most people that have any common sense and that look at the Word of God say, well, there might be about five, four or five places that you can actually argue about. Do some study on this. You'll find out where you're at. Mark 16. Remember that passage at the end, verses 9 through 20 or so? He talks about baptism. We can't cut that out. Well, guess what? We have Matthew 28. Nobody doubts that. It's real. Romans 6. Acts 2. You see what I'm saying? Even if we say, well, you can cut Mark 16 out of my Bible, which I don't recommend. You cut it out, though, we still have the proof that baptism is necessary. It only has to say it one time. Exactly. And it's authoritative, isn't it? We can believe that it's from God who says it one time. Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch. Where it says he confessed the name of Jesus. They say, well, that's made up. Okay, doesn't Scripture say elsewhere that we need to confess the name of Jesus? Even if you cut it out. Which again, don't cut it out. I'm not recommending that. 1 John 5, it talks about the, the Trinity. Aren't there other places that talk about the Trinity? John chapter 1. And finally, the Pericope Day of Adultery, the woman called the adultery, the passage that we all love. People say, well, that wasn't real. Okay, don't you find forgiveness in other places as well? You see my point? This isn't a discussion for scholars. This is a discussion for all Christians. Because we can know, I believe 100%, that I have a text that God wants me to have. And that will motivate me to action. When I read this and I say, God wanted me to know and understand this, suddenly I take my spiritual life much more serious. Suddenly these words become, like Hebrews 4.12 says, living and active. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Suddenly they make a difference. They change how we act. Rogers, and that's Justin Rogers of Free Hartman, he quotes Royce, which is this smart guy. I don't really know much about him, but anyways, this is what he says. He finds a total of 1,386 variant readings among the big six papyri. That's a bunch of stuff that most people don't care about, and that's okay. Guess this, though. Only three are attributable to theological motivation. Motivation, less than one-fourth of one percent. You say, oh, Mason, I'm tired of this big word stuff. Okay, let me explain. People all the time say, well, the people that copy the Bible, they have their own religious beliefs, and they, they just put what they want to in there to mold everybody else's belief. Less than one-fourth of one percent. That's not a good argument. 
That's not a good argument as we approach God's Word to say, yeah, there was somebody that copied it and they, they put their religious opinion in there. We can't believe it. Less than one-fourth of one percent. The history behind the text, and I don't want this to be a college course. You look, some of you look, oh man, I'm exhausted. But we need to know where the Bible came from. If we don't, we're in trouble. There's four steps. And this is really easy. God inspired the message. If you don't believe that, we're in really big trouble. Canonization. Somebody said this is the Word of God. Because there's tons of books out there. How do we know which ones that we have the right ones? Transmission. How did the text go from 30 A.D. to 2015? That's a long time. Any older there? 30 A.D.? 33? 35? Nobody? That's why it's important. Finally, translation. What we have. Something that we need to be thankful for. The Bible, and I love this slide, although it's so different, 66 books, tons of writers, I think I have five minutes, don't I? It has no contradictions, and this is key, it has one author. How can you know the Bible is true? How can you know that you need to obey it? How can you know what it teaches on baptism, grace, and mercy is right? That's one author. One author. He's infinite. He's eternal. We're going to skip over that period of time. Catch this. The New Testament books did not become authoritative for the church because they were formally included in a list. The church included them in the list because she already regarded them as inspired. When people tell you this, and they will, I promise, they already have me, when they say, Mason, men came up with that book. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. I want to instill that in your head. You say, well, you're boring. I don't care. Get that. Get that men did not come up with these books. God did. And that's how we can know that it's truth and that we need to obey it. Amen. How can I know the Bible is truth? The evidence confirms it. Simply that. We've got to go through these. Go to Types of Bible Translations. It's on there. I want to show you this. I have like three minutes. And I think this is key. Keep going. Right there. Some of you want to know why that the Bible is done in Greek. Don't you? You ever wonder that? You say, well, my Bible says this, and it doesn't agree with your Bible. This is why. You have some that are word for word. When they looked at the Greek word, they said, well, I want it to be word for word. You had other people that say, I want to paraphrase. Or I want to make it where everybody can understand it. There's a place for both. Little kids don't need to pick up the King James and say, well, what is then how? It's okay for them to use a paraphrase, but we don't need to be preaching out of a paraphrase, do we? That's why they're different. So in the end, why is South Jackson having a study on myth versus reality? Ever wonder that? You say, Ray, I got here boring college students for 10 weeks. Come on, man. <laughs> this is why. If we don't nail down truth and its existence, then doctrinal issues will never be known now. That's the simple. In the end, out of the 45 minutes that you listen to me, that's what it's about. If you don't nail down truth, you don't nail down any doctrine. And Christ says a whole lot about doctrine. Matthew 10, 28. Matthew chapter 10 and Matthew 28. The limited commission and the great commission. Talk about doctrine if you look at it. What we should be teaching. What we should be doing. Moving on, I'm going to close with this and we'll be done with the slides. i got some more, but you're already exhausted and that's okay. Ephesians chapter 4. We'll end with this. Ephesians chapter 4. One of my favorite chapters. It talks about what the church of Christ is supposed to be like. What the church of Christ is supposed to look like. Verse 2. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent or really working hard to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. You know why that's so special? 
That's what we're striving to be like, isn't it? And if you have that, people are going to want to come. People are going to want to come. And the only way you can have that is knowing and believing that God's Word is absolute truth. That's what the doctrine matters. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's doctrinal issues. Doctrine shouldn't scare us. It literally means teaching. It's okay. It's okay. It's something we need to be devoted to. I want to end right there. Any thoughts, questions, comments? You can get the rest of the slides from Ray. If you want them. If you want to run from it, that's okay too.